So um, my talk is called in in English Yiddish Xinhua Serie China in Modernist Yiddish Culture. And the talk is part of a book project that I'm working on, a study of Yiddish writings, poems, translations, fiction, travelogues, journalism, and memoirs about China. These uh -huh. works were written and published in the first half of the 20th century in Shanghai, in Warsaw, and New York. The title, the working title of my book, book in progress is China Through Yiddish Eyes, Translating Culture in the Early 20th Century. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to summarize very briefly the project as a whole. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to consider some key examples of two Yiddish translations of Chinese poems taken from the New York modernist journal called Schriften, or Writings, and published in New York in 1925 and 1926. In my talk, I'm going to try to make some, I hope, unexpected connections between the 8th century classical Chinese poet Li Bai a 20-something-year-old Jewish immigrant to New York, and both famous and obscure American literary figures. Through poetry in Chinese, Yiddish, and English, I hope to make you think in a new way about culture and translation. And I just have to say that sitting here in speaking to you and listening to um, what I'm saying translated um, all but simultaneously into Russian, I'm going to learn something else about cultural translation, too. The history of the Jews in China, both modern and medieval, has recently begun to attract considerable scholarly attention. But the history of Yiddish in China, or about China, remains, with the exception of the work of one established scholar, pretty much an untold story. In the mid-19th century, Jewish merchants, mainly from Iraq, often via India, arrived in China and played a major role in the building of modern Shanghai. After 1898, Jews from Russia settled in the northern Chinese city of Harbin, first as traders and later as refugees from the Bolshevik Revolution and from the Russian Civil War. In the early decades of the 20th century, a very few Jews from Poland and, um, and Russia and Belarus visited China as tourists, drawn by a combination of curiosity about the cultural exoticism of a truly foreign culture and an affinity that Polish Jewish socialists and communists felt as these political movements had begun, begun to re, um, emerge in China. During World War II, Shanghai served as a port of refuge for European Jews, including many Yiddish speakers. From the very start, China fascinated the Eastern European Jews, and among them, Yiddish writers. For these writers, China represented the ultimate other, I think. And in their writings, they began to translate that otherness for readers of the Yiddish press from the cities to the remote shtetlech, or towns, of Poland and throughout the United States. These acts of translation consisted of actual Yiddish renderings of Chinese poems and other texts, and also included travelogues, ethnographic reports, and as I said before, journalism, memoir, stories, and original poems that attempted to make China comprehensible and recognizable to the Yiddish writers, Jewish readers. So these acts of literary, cultural, and existential translation brought something new to Yiddish writing, which at that very time was transforming itself into a modern literature. As they began to conceive of Yiddish as the language for a world-class literature, Yiddish writers in America struggled to determine what of their own traditions, of Jewish traditions, to keep 
and what to leave behind, as well as what of other cultures in the world, including China's, to bring into Yiddish. It's important to note, too, that this cultural dialogue from Chinese into Yiddish was reciprocated. A friend of mine who's a great Chinese uh, scholar at Hebrew University, Irene Eber, has observed that the Chinese were reading Yiddish literature in the 1920s, and the Yiddish writers were reading Chinese at the same time. The Yiddish literature is being translated into Chinese, Chinese literature into Yiddish. Yet the two people met, as says my friend Irene Eber, only through translation. They met on the page, and they didn't actually encounter one another in person. And I should say that a lot of the translations from Yiddish into Chinese came through Russian because Yiddish had been translated into Russian and then from Russian into Chinese, of, um, of a work of cultural translation. Um, and this is a book, this is the cover of a book published in Warsaw in 1918, and it's called China, China. And it's from a series called Länder und Völker, Countries and People, and Peoples. This, this um, book, with illustrations of drawings, photographs, and calligraphy, was written to teach a popular Warsaw readership about China as an example of an exotic people and place. So the cover image is of a woman in what appears to be traditional garb, seated at an in an elegant setting. She seems to have bound feet, she seems to be dressed in a stiff Chinese silk gown and is holding a fan. Her face is placid and inscrutable, which of course are Western cliches about the Chinese, about the East. Down the left side, vertically, of the cover, you can see the Yiddish letters that say the title of the book, China. China. These Hebrew letters, Yiddish of course is written in Hebraic letters, are stylized to resemble the brush strokes of Chinese characters and their vertical layout, the columns of traditional Chinese writing. In contrast, if you look at the top of the image, at the top panel, there are two neoclassical male figures, muscle-bound and almost nude, who are opening a globe that depicts Africa and Europe on the left and Asia and Australia on the right. In the middle of the split image of the earth, a streamlined modernist font proclaims in Yiddish countries and peoples. The photograph of the Chinese woman and the drawing of the male nudes it depict an explicit non-Jewishness which are mediated for the Yiddish reader by the stylized lettering, which brings the world, East and West, home to Polish Jews. So in this book cover, I think we can read a cultural mission of exploration, apprehension, acquisition, and revelation that breaks open the traditionalism of Yiddish by importing the traditions of China and indeed of peoples and nations world over, and thus can expand the known world for Yiddish speakers. The process of expansion was complicated, though, by the limitations that most Yiddish writers had in their ability to understand Chinese culture. Things were not always what they may have seemed. For example, the cover photograph is is uh, not what it what I just described it to be in the in the uh, uh, page or so a moment or so before, according to one of my colleagues at Penn, uh, Professor Wang, photography studios were introduced in China in the early 20th century. Most were located in Shanghai, where their most frequent customers were courtesans, prostitutes, photos of whom. Uh, dressed in traditional garb, were exhibited in show windows of photo studios and published in newspapers. So given this historical context, it's very likely 
course I have no proof, but I think that the woman depicted in this picture was a courtesan. Yet it seems unlikely that the Yiddish authors or the, or the publisher um, were aware of this fact. On the cover of this 1918 Yiddish book then, the picture of a Shanghai courtesan intended to represent the Western perception of traditional Chinese culture interjects an unintended, erotic, and illicit subtext into a Warsaw Yiddish reader's expectations of what he or she would learn about Chinese culture. So this implicit costumed eroticism, whether or not recognized by the Yiddish audience, counterbalances the Greek nudity of the male figures who hold up the globe at the top of the cover. The foreignness of both images, female and male, clothed and nude, Eastern and Western, may well have conveyed to the Polish Yiddish reader the message of how extensively the Jewish world had grown and expanded. And um, this image that you see now of the title page of the volume, when you open the cover, this is the first page you see, um, prints China, China in red ink and bears the stamps of all the libraries and archives that have owned it. And in, in this way, I think, um, carrying along the idea of the expand, expanded Jewish world um, in 1918, uh, we see a kind of world traveler's passport. The book itself becomes a kind of passport. So the 1918 example of how the outside world is imported into Yiddish is balanced by contemporaneous movements within Yiddish culture that attempted to describe Yiddish culture itself with the eyes of outsiders. What I mean by this is that the Yiddish depictions of China occurred within the context of ethnographic expeditions among Jews by Jews in the Pale of Settlement and Poland. For example, Yudlamid Peretz, um, Shin Ansky, Noah Prilutsky, uh, um, who set, went out into the Shtetlech and in the small towns and collected folklore and folk artifacts about, of Yiddish culture, Jewish culture, that they perceived was being destroyed and vanishing by war, by persecution, and by urbanization and modernization. So the second example is um, that of Yiddish modernist poets and writers in New York City in the 19 teens and 20s. The final issue of a New York modernist miscellany or anthology called Schriften, published in 1925-1926, included a section called Von Alte Qualen, from Old Wellsprings which featured translations into Yiddish of the Chinese poet Li Tai Po, or whom I'm gonna call Li Bai in the, most of the talk, published alongside Yiddish versions of Japanese haiku, Egyptian, Arabic, and American Indian poems, as well as an excerpt from the Finnish Kalevala and a book called The Birth of Buddha. So um, this eclectic work of trans, group of translations was characteristic of Schriften. Earlier issues of the journal had included translations from Greek and Latin classics and 19th century Americans like Walt Whitman and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The translations of Chinese among other languages broke down the perceived provincialism of Jewish language, of the Jewish language Yiddish and opened it up to the world. And I should just say that um, the Yiddish translators in, in this, this issue of Schriften um, uh, translated these works in the context of American modernism, but also in the context of other American Yiddish translations or writings about um, China. Um, and uh, these included other Yiddish writings about China or translations about China, including, uh, included um, a, a, a collection of Chinese philosophy and poetry, uh, a translation into Yiddish of Lafcadio Hearn's uh, Some Chinese Vo uh, Ghosts, 
And also, um, um, uh, across the pond in uh, Germany, Martin Buber's translation and adaptations into German of, uh, and connections between Hasidism and Chinese philosophy. Um, so by importing Chinese poetry and reports of Chinese history and culture, um, these Yiddish writers expanded the boundaries of Jewish cultural uh, sensibility. And I just, I'll say very briefly that the other, uh, each volume of, um, each volume of Shriften was about uh, three to four hundred pages long. It was not a little pamphlet. Uh, and it, and the, the journal came out irregularly between 1912 and 1926. And, and one more thing to say briefly is that it included some of the early uh, publications of the great figures in Yiddish modernism, of the Junga poets like Moshe Leib Halpern and Mani Leib, and the fiction writers like um, um, and Lamed Shapiro. Um, and, uh, and so it was, a, it was a quite a, an event, um, this, this journal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, now what you see is the table of contents for von Alte Kvalen in Yiddish, and then if you flip it again, you'll see my English translation is a little bit more legible, just because it's bigger, of, um, of the works that were published in this section of translations. The, the Yiddish translations of six poems by the Tang dynasty poet Li Bai, who lived from 701 to 762 in the Common Era, considered one of Chinese greatest classical poets. And the, the poems that were included uh, by Mayor Sticker, who was the translator, um, you can see his name there, it says Chinese poems, um, were called, I'm just gonna read you the titles of these, these six poems. One is called Weinlied or Wine Song, one is called A Brief von Chang Khan, A Letter from Tsang Khan, Zu seine Kinder, To His Children, Die Freu Rett, His Wife Speaks, Er gesegen sich mit ihr, He Takes Leave of Her, and Crowen Vernacht, Crows at Dusk. So um, the, the translator of this, these Chinese poems was Meir Sticker. Um, he was from Galicia. And he had studi studied in a German language school and lived in Vienna before he came to New York in 1920 when he was 15 years old. In New York, he worked as a news editor for the Yiddish press into the 1970s. He died in 1983. Starting at the age of 19 years old, Sticker published his own poems, short stories, and many literary translations, including translations of T.S. Eliot, Rimbaud, Rilke, uh, Tuavim, tu Mandelstam, and Ernest Heming Hemingway, as well as his exotic translations. So um, um, let's look at the first um, the first of the translations of Mayor Sticker's translations I want to look at is called A Brief von Chang Khan. So I promised um, at least one person in the room I would read in Yiddish. Uh, so bear with me for a moment. Um, so I'm going to read the, the I'm going to read Mayor Sticker's translation of Li Bai's poem called a letter from Chang Khan, or a brief von Chang Khan. I'm going to read it in Yiddish. Okay. Ich hab a brief von Chang Khan. Ich hab sich gespielt mit Blimelech beim Teuer. Meine Haare haben Keum, der greicht mein, mein Stern. Du bist angekommen, reiten dich auf dein Bamboo stecken und verwählt sich bei der Bank. Mit grünen Fläumen an Stott spiel ich lech. Otter Zoi hab mir gewohnt in Stott Zankan, Kinder zwei, was haben sich auf Gornisch nicht gericht. Zu 14 Jahren hast du mich vor dein Weib genommen. Ich bin bewesen, schämmig dick und nicht gekannt, mein Ponem trocken frei. Hab noch gelost mein Kopf und äußert, äußert ihm zu der schwarzer Wand. 
Du hast mich öfter tausendmal gerufen, ich habe geschwiegen und sich nicht umgeguckt auf viele. Bei 15 habe ich schon gekannt, verrichten sich die Bremen und beten sollst mich haben lieb, bis mir wellen werden Stäub und Asch. Du hast geglaubt den Gläuben von Weisheng, was hat gewahrt unter der Brick das Herz erkennen teut. Und ich, und ich habe keinmal nicht gewusst, als ich will dürfen, wenn er reiflechten dem Berg Wang, Yang Fu, äh, Wang Fu, er reis gucken auf dir a so viel Tag. Wenn ich bin alt geworden, sechsten Jahr, bist du weg von mir. A weg zum Besen kling kiu zang wo Riesensteine stellen sich a kegen im Pet im Pettigen Teich und die Schlüssen kann man nicht durchgehen so mehr Zeit. Hast Hotsch gewährt die Malpes klogen in die heuche Felsen und weißt du, als die Zechen von deiner Fuß tritt bei uns sehr teuer seinen Alt und als jeder Zechen ist bedeckt mit grünem Moch. Der Moch ist tief und eingewachsen man kann ihm nicht wegkehren schon mehr, und die Blätter fallen schon in Ossienwind. Die gelle äh, Schmetterlingen von Oktober flatteren porenweise über den Groß von Vian, 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 äh, von Vian, äh, Grotten. Mein Herz tut weh, wenn ich guck auf sie, ich sitz und treue ein allein, und oh, die Reutkeit von mein Ponem wie nicht. Ob du wirst sich umkehren am Molle heim und ob du wirst mir anschreiben ein Brief vor euch, weil ich kommen dich begegnen, der Weg ist also kurz zum Teich von langen Wind. So, although I'm not going to discuss the Chinese poem on its own terms, I will briefly outline what Sticker's translation of Li Bai's poem brings into Yiddish poetry. And I'm going to put it into the context of modernist Yiddish poetry. So in the form of a letter spoken by a dramatic persona, a young, young Chinese wife poignantly recounts her lifelong relationship to her husband, whom she addresses in his absence. She reminds him how she met him when they were both very young children, how they married at age 14, and how she overcame her initial shyness and silence to ask him to love her forever when she was 15, at the same time that he began to profess the faith of Wei Sheng. A year later, when she was 16, he left her, traveling down the river, to the sinister Klin Kyu Tang, an impassable, treacherous place. When she asks him if he could hear the monkeys complaining in the high cliffs, she expresses within her fantasy of his experience a worry that he may not have survived the journey. Then the speaker turns to describe what remains of her husband at home the traces of your footprints by our gate, which have been there so long now that every trace is covered with green moss, and the moss cannot be swept away. As she contemplates her situation at home, as she waits for him, she invokes the changing seasons, the leaves fall in the autumn wind, and the yellow butterflies of October flutter in pairs over the grass of fading gardens. The image of mating butterflies and the progression of time from summer into fall makes her head hurt, and she mourns his absence as she grows older and her cheeks turn pale, the flush of her face fades. The poem ends with her, when she expresses her hope that her husband will come home again, and in anticipation of this homecoming, she offers to walk out to greet him, stating that the distance is short or would seem short to her in her desire, 
if he would tell her in advance in a letter that he was coming home. So you might expect that, the, that this poem uh, in translation would be filled with exoticism, but actually there are only two elements of the exotic that, that Mayor Sticker's translation brings into English. In fact, these two things are, one, the exotic elements are, one, the Chinese names of people and places, um, which are hard to transliterate into the Hebraic Yiddish alphabet. Uh, Tsang Khan, Wei Shang, Wang Fu, Klin Kyu Tang. Um, and these names, these Chinese names, lend the translation an apparent authenticity. Um, and in fact, uh, there are very few uh, Hebraic or Slavic words in Mayer Sticker's Germanic diction of this poem. And so the Chinese names stand out even more starkly. So the other thing, the second element of exoticism in this translation into Yiddish are some of the images, blossoms, bamboo, plums, the racing river, the monkeys, the moss, the butterflies. These are images that recur in many of Levi's Chinese poems, but taken together, they're not native to Galicia or New York, where Mayor Sticker had lived, or Vienna. Um, this specificity, these images, also emphasize the foreignness of the poem. So, in contrast, though, to these features of foreignness or exoticism, the poem's form and tropes speak in a very familiar way to the sophisticated reader of Yiddish in the mid-1920s. First, the form of the poem spoken by a dramatic persona, which reveals character, situation, and narrative, was a, a, a form that was greatly interesting to and used often by some of the major modernist Yiddish poets at this time who were experimenting with genre and language to expand the repertoire of Yiddish poetry beyond what uh, one of the poets called the rhyming department of the labor movement. Secondly, the, the decision to write a dramatic monologue in the, f in the voice of a female persona, um, a male poet writing this, or a woman poet writing a dramatic monologue in the voice of a male persona, was something also very much being tried in the mid-1920s in American the Yiddish modernist circles. So, and finally, what was familiar in this, in this Yiddish translation of this Chinese poem to, uh, to the Yiddish readers of Schriften was the story of a girl married off very young who, in, a, in an arranged marriage who comes to love her husband. Um, in fact, for this revolutionary generation of Yiddish writers, who themselves or whose older brothers and sisters had rebelled against the long-standing old world custom of arranged marriages um, and other features of traditional Judaism. This story of the, the girl forced into marriage who comes to love her husband is, is one that is a familiar uh, situation. To make such an old-fashioned wife deeply sympathetic, as this poem does, requires a leap of cultural imagination and calls up a reconsideration of tradition. Such invocation of archaic practices poses aesthetic and ideological challenges that a number of modernist poets embraced. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch uh, subjects a little bit and we're gonna think about what the sources were for Mayer Sticker's translation into Yiddish of Li Bai. So it's almost certain that New York Yiddish writers and translators did not know Chinese or Japanese or Egyptian or probably not Arabic. And it's very unlikely that they had native speakers as informants. 
Although I must say, I did have a fantasy at one point that maybe Mayor Sticker had a Chinese neighbor on the Lower East Side of New York who would have then had an edition of Lee Bai's poems and they would have sat down together in a cafe and uh, worked through a translation collaboratively, but I don't think that really happened. <laughs> in fact, um, how, did they, how did these Yiddish writers in New York come to these exotic poems? Well, they had to be working from translations into other lang European or American languages, and um, the next part of the paper I'm going to talk briefly about the English translations that Mayer Sticker probably used as his source. So, in fact, in 1925, Mayer Sticker had a number of English translations of Chinese poetry to choose from, published in England and America. But what struck me first with when I, when I came upon this Yiddish translation was that Sticker's Abrieb von Chang Khan was based on the same Chinese poem that the American modernist poet Ezra Pound, very famous and, and infamously fascist during World War II, had used for his famous translation called The River Merchant's Wife, a letter, which had first come out in his collection of English poems in 1915. So um, I really wanted, again, this paper, this talk is filled with fantasy. I really wanted Mayor Sticker to have translated Ezra Pound's translation because there would be this incredible connection between Yiddish modernism and American modernism. Um, okay, so I, when I compared the Yiddish with Ezra Pound's English, though, um, it wasn't, that wasn't the connect, there was no connection because uh, Sticker's poem is much longer, Ezra Pound cuts and pastes and does all sorts of fancy footwork and makes a very different poem. And then, um, so the next place I looked was Amy Lowell. Um, you can go another one there, okay. Amy Lowell, uh, another American modernist poet um, uh, who was a, uh, Ezra Pound's uh, fellow imagist, and eventually Ezra Pound hated her and made fun of her. Um, and uh, Amy Lowell uh, from Boston uh, translated this same poem in her 1921 book, Fur Flower Tablets, Poems from the Chinese, on which she collaborated with her friend, uh, a native Chinese speaker and scholar, Florence Eiskoff. But um, even though Amy Lowell had translated from Chinese with her friend, and Ezra Pound had translated from a, an English translation of a Japanese translation of Li Bai, um, that both their poems actually were the same length and Mayor Sticker's poem was much longer, so Amy Lowell was also not the source. It wasn't until this fall, sitting in the library at Harvard University where I was visiting for the year, did I come upon the source, I'm pretty sure. A 1922 volume of translations devoted entirely to the poems of Li Po or Li Bai by Shigiyoshi Obata. Although Sticker's, the, the number of lines was the first clue that this was the source for Mayor Sticker. Although Sticker's Yiddish has 45 lines and Obata's has only 36 lines, Sticker managed to get extra lines, nine extra lines, by dividing seven of Obata's long lines into two shorter lines. Throughout his Yiddish, Sticker's choice of phrasing is an, is an almost exact translation of Obata's English translation. Um, and the fact that Sticker translated into Yiddish Obata's English translation of Li Bai connects Sticker to the lineage of American modernists because Obata himself tells in his introduction that he decided to translate Li Bai as a reaction against the translations by Pound and Amy Lowell. And in his preface, um, Obata explains that as a Japanese, that's what he calls himself, a Japanese who studied and traveled in America, he was a lifelong student and lover of Chinese poetry. 
Although I have not been able to find any other biographical information on Obata, he seems to have immigrated to the United States and settled in New York. The fact that a Japanese immigrant to America would have translated the classical Chinese poem, poet Li Bai into English is not unlikely because the traditional Japanese education of this period would have included the study of classical Chinese poetry. Um, the fact that Obata's translation was the basis for the translation of these poems into Yiddish by Sticker, also an immigrant writer, is more interesting to me because it suggests a conversation between immigrant cultures in America, which also has ramifications of the shock waves of difference that those conversations contain, whether literally between people or figuratively between a reader and a book. And again, I don't think, as much as I would love to fantasize that Obata and Sticker sat down together on the Lower East Side, I don't think they knew each other. The one thing that uh, distinguishes Obata's English from Sticker's Yiddish is the fact that Obata wrote footnotes on his poem. And um, in these footnotes, Obata explains the place names as geographical and historical and linguistic. Um, and um, and he, 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 he explains certain customs and other things. Um, and it seems to me that Sticker absorbed Obata's footnotes into his translation. He, as he renders Obata's English into Yiddish, he sort of, uh, he sort of glosses the footnotes in his Yiddish translation. In fact, the, f the way that, that Sticker absorbed Obata's uh, glosses and notes on the poems um, in English is also reflected in Sticker's other translations of other of Obata's English translations of Li Bai. Okay, for example, in the poem, Kloen, uh, Sticker's uh, Yiddish translation, Kloen Farnacht, Crows at Dusk, is a slightly expanded version of Obata's English translation, The Crows at Nightfall. Obata's translation reads, um, you can see it up here and you can probably see it in the uh, pamphlet as well, um, uh, in the following way, and it has an explanatory footnote. Um, in the twilight of yellow clouds, the crows seek their nests by the city wall. The crows are flying home, cawing, cawing to one another in the treetops. Lo, the maid of Chin Chown at her loom, weaving brocade, for whom I wonder. She murmurs softly to herself, <coughs> excuse me, behind the blue mist of gauze curtain. She stops her shuttle and broods sadly, remembering him who is far away. She must lie alone in her bower at night and her tears fall like rain. Obata writes a footnote saying the theme of this poem is a well-known story of a young wife who was left alone in Chang'an by her husband while he lived in another city. So, so Obata writes in his note, the theme of the poem is a well-known story of a young wife who was left alone in Chang'an by her husband while he lived in another city with his mistress. The deserted wife composed poems of her love and fidelity, and weaving them into the piece of brocade, sent it to her husband, who was so moved thereby that he called her to his side and lived with her in happiness ever after. Um, what the most important difference between o Obata's English version of this poem and Sticker's Yiddish version is the footnote. Sticker does not translate the footnote but it has moved him deeply. Both, his, both the English translation by Obata and the Yiddish translation by Sticker tell the story of a beautiful woman who works at her loom as evening falls and the cawing crows fly back to their nests. The bird's noisy return to their nests reminds the woman that her beloved is far away and she weeps at the thought that she will sleep alone again that night. But only with the footnote does Obata communicate the importance of this maiden solitude to the English reader. 
Um, and Obata there explains that Levi's poem is based on a famous legend of a deserted wife. It's a quite a melodrama who uses her embroidery to tell a story that persuades her husband to leave her, his mistress and come home to her. As Obata relates it, this legend emphasizes the subtle persuasive power of a woman's gendered and sexualized artistry, her embroidery, her storytelling, while at the same time it suggests the conventional trope that Li Bai himself may have invoked, assuming a submissive female voice to appeal to the emperor for his favor. And the way that I knew that Sticker had read and responded to this footnote, and I'll stop being pedantic in a moment, is that, he cha that Sticker changes the, maid the word maiden that Obata chose, thank you, um, to, um, he changes the word maiden uh, to Freud, woman or wife. So it's clear that, Obata, that, that Sticker had read the footnote and, and um, and responded to it and was trying to incorporate that legend into his poem. Mm -hmm. So in classical Chinese poetry, not every love poem is exactly what it appears to be. A love poem in classical Chinese poetry might be an appeal to the emperor for political favor. And I don't know, we, in Yiddish we say lahavdol. I'm not sure it's an exact uh, con comparison, but um, in, in Yiddish translations of Chinese poetry, uh, not every translation is actually what it appears to be either, and that's where I'm, I'm gonna end. This is leading into the end of the talk. In a very unusual move for a translator, Sticker joins into one single Yiddish poem four short, discrete translations from different sections of Obata's book in order to expand upon the narrative of a deserted wife. So Sticker's Yiddish translation of Li Bai, called His Wife Speaks, Die Freu Rett, is the translation with which I'm going to finish the talk. Among Obata, Lowell, uh, and pound, none, not one single book of, of English translations of Li Bai has a poem called His Wife Speaks. Yet a search of Obada's book produced undeniable evidence to me that Sticker created his four-part poem in the voice of a woman whose husband has long since departed from four utterly unconnected poems by Li Bai and translated by Obata. Sticker takes um, four different uh, five or, I mean four or eight line um, ancient or modern poems uh, by Li Bai and weaves them together into a poetic sequence that imitates the modernist poetic form of the dramatic monologue. Okay, die Freirette. Wenn du bist da gewen, is full gewen dos hois mit blumen, it's der as du bist nicht da, a pustevet dos ledige gelenge. Der eus geschickt der zu deck liegt, zu neu gewickelt auf dem Bett, ich kenn nicht schlafen, drei jahr schon as du bist nicht da. Der reach, was is verblib, verblibben hinter dir, verfolgt tief alt. Der Reach blonget um, nor wo bist du geliebter? Ich krieg's gelle Blätter fallen von die Zweigen, ich wein, der Toi blitzet weiß auf ein grünem Moch. Number, then part two. Weiße Buschikes fliehen in Levone Schein, Herr, die Mädlich kläuben Wasser ähm, Kastanes vertracht, und gehen singen dicke heim, in der stiller Nacht. So, das Groß von Yen wächst green und lang und in Chin, in, 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 in Chin hängen die Mäulbär uh, uh, zweigelech bei der Tier. Als sind das mein Herz ist zerbrochen krank, trachst du, Gott, mein Teire, von kommen zurück zu mir.
O oh, nicht gebetener und fremder Frühlingswind, nicht spiel sich mit die seidene Vorhänge lechet sind. And number four, ob gescheit von dir sitz ich allein und klog unter die Himmeln von je lang in mein Häus beleichten voll Levonischein, von Levonischein kommt selten ein Schliches und von dir. In Frühling fliehen wilde Gens keins von und stellen ob sich bei mein Tier und kommen später zurück her aber nicht kein Briefel von Yu Chang. So unlike the legendary wife in Obata's note to the crows at nightfall, whose feminine artistry weaving brocade speaks as eloquently of her love and fidelity to her absent husband as the poet's own words, the wife in Sticker's compiled translation has no success in persuading her husband to return. The woman's embroidered coverlet lies inertly rolled up on her bed. She does not weave, nor does she write to her husband, but she passively sighs and weeps. She hears the girls singing as they gather water chestnuts and head home. And, um, and when she asks her husband if he thinks of returning to her, it seems that she's talking to herself rather than writing him a letter. Finally, she sits alone and she weeps, waiting vainly through the seasons marked by the migrations of wild geese and wild geese that mate for life, unlike, it seems, her husband and herself, and she's waiting for a letter from him that does not seem to come. So you can see here part one of Sticker's poem, uh, is an almost exact translation of a poem of a translation by Obata that appears on page 30 of his book. And in the second English translation by Obata, which also occurs on page 28 of his book, and that Sticker has taken as part two of his uh, compilation, um, the Yiddish translator has converted four long English lines into seven shorter um, Yiddish lines. Okay, and if you look at the Obata translation and, the, and my English version of the Sticker translation, the main difference is that Sticker has changed the bird in the middle of the poem, the white herons, into the white storks, from herons to bushikas. And you might ask why would, um, wh what difference does it make if the bird is a heron or a stork? Well, um, a heron was something that Sticker probably didn't really know about, but a stork, a bushika was, I mean, you probably, I don't know storks in America, but I think in, in your part of the world, storks are a common bird, and they certainly were uh, in the countryside around where Sticker grew up. What the change of the bird in this, in this rendition that, that Sticker brings into Yiddish of the Chinese poem through Obata's English, the result, the result of that is that uh, Sticker brings a kind of nostalgia, a Yiddish nostalgia for the old country into this American Yiddish tr modernist translation of Chinese poetry. And he's sort of, uh, he's, I mean, he's almost, uh, he's almost contradicting his own modernist agenda to bring the foreign, you know, to bring Yiddish into the world and to bring the world into Yiddish. And he's actually bringing Chinese poetry home to the heart of, of someone who grew up in Yiddish uh, in, the, in the Galician countryside. So now we have Obata's poem uh, to his wife translation to his wife, and we have Sticker's last stanza of His Wife Speaks. And um, I think in this one, uh, Sticker um, uh, gives us the most explicit example of how the Yiddish translator has transposed the Chinese poem into a Yiddish poem. Obata's version of To His Wife presents in four lines a husband's lament to his absent wife. The husband says to his wife, 
divided from you, I lament alone under the skies of Ye Lang. In my moonlit house, seldom a message arrives. I watch the wild geese all go north in the spring, and they come south, but not a letter from Yu Chang. And uh, we have a footnote from Obata. Obata loves footnotes, and I love his footnotes too, which says, this is evidently addressed by Li Bai to his last wife, who was staying at Yu Chang in central uh, Kiangxi while Li Po was traveling westward to his place of banishment. In Obata's English translation of Li Bai's poem, the husband, whom Obata thinks is Li Bai himself, it's an autobiographical love poem, he suggests, the husband tells how forcibly separated from his wife, for political reasons, he weeps alone in one location, Ye Lang, where at night he waits in vain for a message from her. Right, so he lives in Ye Lang, and, she, and he's wanting, dying for a letter from her from where she is in Yu Chang. And meanwhile, the seasons pass. The wild geese go north in the spring, and they come south in the winter. And he's, never, he's not hearing from his wife, and he's really lonely and very upset. In the Yiddish version, again, the birds tell it all, um, strangely enough. Um, in the Yiddish version, um, Sticker um, sort of, uh, for, well, the main thing he does is he, he takes the, the poem out of the man's voice and puts it in the woman's voice. It's, not, it's no longer the husband addressing his wife, but now it's the deserted wife addressing her husband. So you can see he's taken autobiograph apparently autobiographical love poetry and made it into a dramatic monologue, given it to a totally different, he did a gender bend. And for some strange reason, um, um, again, not being a specialist in birds, Sticker has the wild geese heading northward and stopping at his doorstep. And then, for, at some inexplicable moment, heading in another direction later in the season, probably heading south, but he doesn't tell us that, uh, later they return there and they stop at the doorstep again. And again, I just think that maybe um, Sticker just didn't know about my geese, wild geese migration and he associated geese with a farmyard, you know, <laughs> with, I don't, I don't know, I mean, and I just, I'm making fun of Sticker and I don't really mean to, but just for, to his credit, he also does, uh, a, he manages to get a rhyme scheme, rhyming lines in the Yiddish, and the rhyme works better when he words it the way he does in the Yiddish, and the geese stop at his door. It just, it works that way, so. Okay, so um, in the same, in contrast to the way that Sticker really read Obata's footnote uh, in the crows, po the poem about the crows, uh, and used it very sensitively, he seems to ignore Obata's footnote here, and as I said, he switches genders, and he makes the, the husband into the, the husband's words become the wife's words, and he totally recasts the poem. So Sticker places Levi's four unrelated poems together into a monologue and a sequence spoken by a deserted wife. This act of selection and compilation ex creates an extended narrative that makes the Chinese lyrics into a story very recognizable to Jewish immigrants in America, the story of the Aguna. At the turn of the century, men, Jewish men immigrating to um, the United States would often leave their wives behind in Poland, Belarus, or Galicia, sometimes for years and sometimes forever. Not only a social reality, the deserted wife or the aguna in Yiddish and Hebrew, aguna is a Yiddish and Hebrew word, is also a complex category within Jewish law that dates back to the rabbinic period. And, it's the stat and, and the word aguna describes the status of a woman who is not married, not divorced, 
not widowed, but she is anchored or bound by the fact that she has been deserted. So this figure of a woman in sexual, legal, and social limbo was often invoked by modern Yiddish and Hebrew writers to serve a variety of symbolic or allegorical purposes. By joining together four of Levi's poems of longing to form a Jewish immigrant narrative, Sticker both Judaized the Chinese poems and infused the familiar story, the familiar Jewish story of an abandoned wife with a new kind of beauty through the Chinese imagery of nature. And so I'm going to conclude with the unexpected cross-cultural collaboration and expropriation. A, a Yiddish poet adopt, adapts a Japanese scholar's translation of the Chinese classical poet in order to tell a Jewish immigrant story. And that, that, that the fact that the story is spoken by a wife left alone who longs and desires is no accident. Inventing this woman's voice from, a po from poems by a Chinese man in the 8th century, the 20th century immigrant Jew finds a new way to express his own sense of longing and desire. And this representation of um, culture through a woman brings us back to the courtesan photograph on the cover of the 1918 Warsaw book, China, China. This image of an elegantly costumed Chinese woman seated before the camera's gaze in Shanghai eerily anticipates a drawing published in the 1925-1926 issue of Schriften, where the Yiddish translations that we've just talked about were published. A drawing by Avram Bloom, a Jewish immigrant artist who has now been virtually forgotten. Like the photograph of the Chinese prostitute or courtesan, Bloom's drawing places the full figure of a seated woman monumentally in the center of the page. I'm not suggesting that this woman is a courtesan, by the way. Uh, both subjects wear their hair pulled back from their faces and wrapped into buns at each ear. Both sit with their knees slightly apart, their left elbow raised, and their right hand in their laps while the stiff, elaborate dress obscures the Chinese woman's body, the plain shift of the woman in Bloom's drawing draw, uh, reveals the outlines of her breasts and her hips. These two images of women, Chinese and perhaps presumably Jewish, become, for my argument, emblematic of how Yiddish writers conveyed the experiences, both of perceiving the cultural other in the modern world and of experiencing the dislocation of modernity. And Mayor Sticker's Yiddish translations of Li Bai's Chinese poems through Obata's English translations triangulate a dialogue between chi traditional China, modernist America, and the immigrant Jewish poet's own attempt to define a place in the modern world for Yiddish literature. <laughs>